So hello and welcome to a new episode of Injury Time. With me we have uh, Pradeep Reddy again once again uh, to review the forthcoming. Sorry, actually to preview the forthcoming season. So uh, Pradeep, how are you? How is quarantine treating you? Yeah, not bad. I mean, it's a little bit tougher than expected, but I think we're making the most of it by getting some research on the uh, teams and keeping up to date with all the preseason matches through the fans and whatever snippets we can get from social media. So I'm looking so, forward so, to six days to go now. Six days to go. Okay. So uh, having been in quarantine for let's say six, I think eight days now. Yep. How is this going to affect the entire tournament when the whole group of players have to stay? I think six months away from their family, alone, not really able to socialize. Injuries probably go down on themselves, and you're injured. You're not training as well. So all these kind of things. So how do you think this season will go in that sense? I think it's. I mean, it's definitely going to be tough, and it's a unique experience. I mean, I don't think anyone can really hazard a guess as how it's going to pan because it's the first time for everyone. Um, I think some of the positives you can probably say would be teams that have been put together who've had a lot of changes, like where there's a lot of new t- new players coming in. Some of the clubs, I think they might actually benefit from it because they're all you know in a close knit setting now, and then you've forced to sort of bond and socialize with one another i think it'll bring the probably the foreign players and the indian players a little bit closer because you're all in that same environment sharing hotels and and, and aspect but as you said i think uh, we've seen already where players get injured and they have to go outside the bubble to get a scan or treatment and then automatically puts them back into a quarantine you're away from your teammates for 10 days and then you have to train in isolation. So there's definitely going to be some mental, uh, psychological issues. I think mental strength is going to be a key factor in this season, um, especially when players get injured or not even just injured. If you're not with the main squad, if you're one of the reserves, I think you're going to have a, a tough time. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's not easy for anyone to be, I mean, footballers are used to being away from their families, but not in this kind of an environment. So I think that'll add an extra layer of stress on everybody. So hopefully the new year will have, you know, things will improve a little bit on all fronts. Um, and then we, we can get back to whatever the new normal is. Especially the uh, squad players, like you said. They, this year everybody is 30, 35 people. 30, 34, whatever it is. So I think most of them, or quite a few of them, will get chances to play, especially with the five substitution rules and things like that. But especially for the fringe players, it's going to be much harder, isn't it? Not even getting a chance to play. Yeah, I mean, I think if you hope that, if you look at the way the squads have been built, a lot of those, what we would hazard a guess as saying fringe players at this stage of the season, are probably some of the younger ones, the developmental players and the youngest players. So I think for those players, I don't think it'll be so much of an issue. They'll probably still be you know, relishing this opportunity where they're staying in fancy hotels. For them, it's their first experience. They get to rub shoulders with uh, top national team players like a Sunil or a, you know, a Pranay Halder. And you've got these young players who probably admire these uh, senior players in their clubs and want to look up to them. And at the same time, they get to sort of mix with foreign players, which will be the first time for some of these younger ones. So I don't think they'll necessarily uh, be so gutted about being in a hotel in Goa for six months. I think they'll probably be more gutted about going back to the academy <laughs> setup, whatever it was at the end of the season. Um, so, you know, I don't think, there's not necessarily all doom and gloom, I think. Perfect. Let's just hope that I'm um, hearing news of, not uh, news of some uh, cure or all those kind of vaccine or things of that nature. Hopefully we get that sooner rather than later in, in India. So, maybe do you think that after that we can go back to the normal home and away? Because they are really looking only half the calendar is published. Right? I think, I don't think we're going to have home and away this season. But I think if we can slowly transition like how leagues have across other parts of the world where we've gone from completely closed stadiums to maybe if, um, you know, family members who are win- within the sort of bubble can start coming to the stadiums like what we saw in the cricket and then maybe opening it up with limited fans if you can allow maybe 50 fans of each club um, initially and then slowly gradually increasing it i think that would be 
a nice a nice progress this season. But I think so, just listening to some of the people and there's a lot of sort of digital advertising and content that's going to happen and interactions with fans. So I'm looking forward to seeing how everyone adapts to that as well, both uh, fan clubs as well as um, you know the media side of it. And yeah, actually yesterday was quite interesting because East Bengal played a friendly match, and we had a Twitter feed from an East Bengal fan which was giving us uh, live updates. And of course, there's one. So by the end of the game, it's like a game of Chinese whispers. I mean, someone was saying it was 4-2. Uh, they beat Kerala Blaster. Somebody else said 3-1. A lot of people were talking about how Balwant scored or whether it was somebody else. And matter of fact, Balwant hadn't even played because he was in. <laughs> so you're relying on people <laughs> spying through a fence and go at these training grounds and getting these snippets of information. So it almost takes me back to the sort of pre uh, Twitter, internet, uh, live coverage of matches days when, you know, early days of the I League when you'd have to rely on somebody at that venue over a phone call to give you information about a match. So it's, it's, it's having to get everyone to be a little bit more creative. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, to preview, let's just go to the teams now. So sure, I sure. want to start with uh, more ATK MB. Is okay. that how I'm supposed to call them? Or? That is the correct way to call them, yes. ATK okay. more. ATK Mohan Bagan. So, yeah. first of all, there was a hoopla about the stars and the crest and all that kind of things. But coming to the, you know, the nitty gritty, they are merged now. They are one entity. I don't know who's the owner. All that is yeah. not very important. But uh, can they do it again? Win the title again? I think. I mean, it, if you if you go previewing team by team, I think AT, ATK Mohan Bagan have got a, definitely a, a very very strong chance. I mean, no one's ever defended the title in the um, ISL No team. Um, and, well, I mean, technically it wouldn't be because it's a brand new thing. Um, but, I mean, what I think I'm trying to get at is if you look at the squad, they've got, they've retained a, um, a lot of the players that were there last season, the likes, and, and you know, the ones who were successful, the likes of Roy Krishna, David Williams, who mass, you know, hugely impressive last season for for Habas's team and the likes of Jayesh Rane, so Sera are just still there. Pranay Hald is still there. Pritam Prabir, and then McHugh's back. Have Avi's back. Uh, Edu Garcia is back. And to add to that, if you look at the players that they've brought in, the way you know Thierry comes in is an experienced left sided centre back, and Sunday Jingan, you've really got you've strengthened areas where you. Possibly felt last season there was a little bit weak, and um, even Subhashish Bose coming in at left back. So they've definitely added in areas where you could say they were a little bit um, lightweight if they had injuries, etc. I think also keeping in mind having to play in a AFC Cup competition this year, I think they've done some pretty astute signings, and um, so there's I definitely expect them to be in the playoffs this year. When you mentioned all the names that they've signed. Now, if you say they signed Tiri and Sandesh Jingan, both of them have come in. They are sure starters. So, what happens to Sumit Rathi? He was such a big thing. Same way with Subhashish Bose coming in. Probably Susai might uh, have to take, you know, players, rotating role. Yeah, I think maybe some of the, the clubs have gone in with the mindset that with so many games yeah, coming in quick succession, it's good to have strength and depth. So, although... You know, when you put their strongest 11 out, you might think, okay, then that means X, Y, and Z might have to sit out in a game. But don't forget there's five subs this year. So Mm -hmm. at any given point, you can strengthen your team, change it, um, you know, depending on whether the situation in the game you're winning or losing or need to chase the game. So I think that helps these teams who've got two players who can play in every single position. And secondly, I think we saw with Habas last year that he did play with a back three at times. Um, and so if he does opt to go with that, then I think he needs a little bit of versatility. So whether Preetam plays as he did last season in a right centre-back position or Sumit Rati plays there, um, it gives him plenty more options. And don't forget, once you get into Asia, you don't have the luxury of five foreigners on the field. It's three plus one. So automatically another Indian berth opens up. So I think they've kept that in mind. Um, as well as a little bit of an eye on the future in terms of some of their signings. And if you look at the duration of the contracts, I think they've definitely got one eye on the future in terms of how they're going with that. Yeah. So, 
Uh, one thing I wanted to ask is, and I think this is probably the wrong year to ask it because there won't be any fans as such in the field. Uh, but do you feel like ATK till now had a very small legacy to look after? Now they have the legacy of Mohan Bagan to look after and all the fans that come with it and all the criticism and all that things that go with it if they don't do well, even one or two games here and there. So do you think they will feel a whole different pressure this year, especially also having to defend the title, so to speak? Um, well, from what we're led to believe, it's just, you know, that's what's in the past, in the past, the last, um, six season of the ISL, this is, uh, sort of brand, you know, a new entity, but as you said, they, de- they definitely have now the added, um, uh, expectations of, of all the, you know, millions and millions of, uh, Mohan Bagan fans behind them. And yeah, if it wasn't a, the situation that we have where everyone's in a bubble and the games are in Goa, you could probably argue that case where that fan pressure that comes at the games and at training, um, et cetera, could be a factor. But um, if you look at their squad, I mean, they're vastly experienced players who've played international level, and the coaches are vastly experienced. So I don't think the pressure from social media as such, because that's realistically going to be the only pressure, uh, will really affect them. And, you know, I think you've got players, players will play, then they might actually, you know, get energized by that kind of a crowd support. You'd actually, you could say in a way that it's a disadvantage not having that support, because imagine if you had to go and play against them at Salt Lake Stadium. And he had a pack 60,000 stadium where, and you know, and when the players that they've got, they go ahead, you've got that crowd pressure playing against you. So I think maybe you, you could also make the case that, you know, they're not benefiting from that massive crowd support and fan support that they could have got this season. So with every team, I'm going to ask you one player that you're really excited to see and one a youngster who you think can make an impact. Okay. So from ATK, who are they? Um, ATK, I mean, I think players wise, I don't think they've gone with anyone that's, um, going to really, uh, change dramatically because they had good players last year. Um, be interesting to see how Sandesh comes back from his injury, both, especially from a national team perspective to see how he settles in and, and how he gets game time. Um, but I think sometimes the way I like to look at it is to see whether kids who've done well one season, if they can continue that development. So the likes of Sumitrati and Susayraj, if they can continue their progress as opposed to becoming labelled as a sort of one-season wonder. Um, and I'm always excited to see their front two. I think David Williams and um, uh, Roy Krishna, I think those those guys are exciting to watch. Just, we'll just have a pause one second, mate. There's someone at the door. Yeah, someone's at the door. Yeah. Yes, mate. Sorry, man. Go on. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, as in terms of a youngster, um, I think I'll have to go with. Go with him, um, with Sumitrati again. I mean, I think I want to see his continued development rather than um, so probably keep an eye eye on him this season. Okay, so now we go to the to Bangalore FC perennial contenders. Mm-hmm. Uh, last year had a lot of trouble scoring goals, depended on set pieces, penalties, all those kind of things to get over the line a lot of times. Very yeah. good defensively. Do you think they've addressed the issue with the signings that they have signed? Because I still don't uh, put much faith in foreign signings until they start doing something. But uh, with your research and all, do you feel like they have addressed the issues there? And 
uh, they've lost Nishu, who was probably the best left back last year. And mm-hmm. uh, they signed Ajit Kumar. So what are you expecting from that side also? I think going forward, uh, um, you know, this uh, striker that they've signed, Christian Opset, I don't think it was their first choice. Uh, I think most of the fans and everyone were craving for a Miku return. And I think Miku's kept them waiting until the last minute and then opted to sign at uh, was it Deportivo yeah. Spain um, because they've got a chance of qualifying and going um, further next season. So I think it was, a, if you look at it compared to some of the strikers that have been signed by some of the other teams, um, I heard that Adam Lafondre was on their sites, um, but he opted to go to Mumbai City FC. I thought Aridane Santana had a great season last year. He could have been one that they'd managed to lure to BFC. And he's gone to Hyderabad. Um, I think Ogbeche is still one of the best strikers we've seen over here in the last couple of seasons, both in terms of his presence in the dressing room, his work rate, um, just all around good good striker and a good uh, good guy. Um, and he was someone who I think would have loved to I remember speaking to someone when he was leaving Northeast, and he would have loved the opportunity to have played in Bangalore. Um, so I think they missed out on potentially some good strikers. Uh, but, you know, let's, let's see how Opset fits into their scheme of things and whether, whether, he can, whether he suits their style of play again. Another call? Someone's at the door? Yeah, I don't know why. Today, all of a sudden. <laughs> yes, man. Sorry. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, so I think the burden once again, obviously, J3 to score. Um, the curious question I think a lot of people might have is will they change the way they play? Will they play? Will they still rely on set pieces? And if they do, then maybe the striker they've signed might benefit that. I mean, if they're going to try and hit teams on the counter-attack, then they still have the likes of Deshaun Brown in their team and Danta and Ashik, um, Leon Augustine. So they've got a lot of pace in that squad. So they can change the way they play a little bit. They don't have to play the way a lot of other teams have chosen to play in the ISL. So I think he's got quite good versatility in the squad. And and again, I think they're just like uh, the first team that we mentioned, like Habas's team. These guys have a lot of retained players. They've got a lot of the core that are still together. So I think that's always gives them a strength. Now, to answer your question in terms of one, two signings, one young player and mm. one player that impresses, I think I'm looking forward to seeing Suresh again to see how he develops. I thought he got a few games last season and he looked impressive. I saw him in preseason at, uh, when they were playing some matches in Bengaluru against BUFC. And he looked he looked sharp and he looked good. Um, from what I'm hearing from people um, in the know is just that uh, this kid or Leon Augustine, after getting his first assist last season, he's really gone back to Kerala and uh, taken it upon himself, got himself a fitness coach, uh, and he's come back bulked up, looking more like you know a proper senior team player as opposed to just an academy kid. So he could be really be challenging the likes of Udanta and Ashik for a starting position. And there's a couple of others in that academy who graduates, you could say, or people who've been promoted from the reserve team. Um, the likes of Ajay Chetri, Edmund, who could really be knocking on the door for first team places this season. And again, with the number of subs allowed, you could see a couple of these guys, if, if and when they're given a chance, it's whether they grab it. So, you know, I'd like to see, um, see those guys develop. Yeah, one question I always wanted to check was uh, BFC's core, the core that's been there, it's been there for a few years now. Chetri is over 35, 
Eric is also around there. Dimas, I think, probably is going to play this one more year. Yeah. And then you have that uh, Cabra, all of them getting to getting on a little bit. So do you yeah. think, and they seem to have a good uh, bunch of group coming in. Like even Sunil specifically mentioned Leon Augustine as someone who he was impressed with in preseason. There's Ajay Chetri, Biswa, uh, Roshan Singh, so yeah. Naram Roshan Singh, all these guys who we have seen in the, you know, super division and things like that. Absolutely, yeah. So this team needs a refresher, sort of. And uh, it looks like Gurpreet has also taken a more of a leadership role from what I hear from, again, people in the club. So do you think they are looking at the next generation to come in, okay, moving move forward? Because they have to sort of, you know. Absolutely. I mean, I think the- that's some of the, in football, that's one of the trickiest things to do is like picking that right moment of how you move on. But you've got to, I mean, obviously you've got players who've played for the club and done well for many seasons and you have to at some point accept that they're on the decline and you have to let them go. I mean, we've seen in the last year or so that you can't have sentiments and um, they've let go of players like Reno Anto, who's a club, you know, legend. Um, Eugene was um, has moved on and you've got to start bringing in players that can replace them. And in terms of, yeah, in Reno's position, you've seen the likes of Ajit Kumar, a fullback's been signed. You've got uh, Biswa who's come through from the... Um, uh, youth team and there's a couple of players who've, who've moved up from the reserve team into into these spots. But when you you've got the players of the likes of Eric Partelou and Dima Salgado, it's very difficult to sort of take that gamble and say let's replace both of them because they're getting on a bit, and then bring in someone new because we saw that last year when they brought in um, Rafael Gusto and a couple of other uh, foreign players. On Wu Freighter, they didn't really settle down. Um, you're already replacing a Seran, you're replacing a Miku. So I think you've got to be careful to do it gradually. And so maybe, you know, replace Seran this year, replace um, the striker position this year. Um, Clayton Silva's come in. So I think maybe next season, as you said, Dima, this could be last season for Dimas. You, you slowly start to phase Dimas out and start to see if, if Suresh or Ajay can play more minutes in that position because don't forget next year there's going to be less foreign players on the field. So you have to transition into that. So that naturally will happen. You don't have to find a replacement for Dimas. You just have to find an Indian player who can play in that position. And then obviously the inevitable question with BFC is always how, and it's the same with the national team, how and when do you start to replace the the legend himself? So that's also something that BFC have got to slowly sort of integrate both, as you mentioned, whether whether it's Gurpreet taking over more leadership role. Um, but on field, I, don't, I think he's irreplaceable. What he provides that team in terms of his goals, assists, and more importantly, you know, in crunch games, how he comes up big, that's just a quality that, you know, it's, 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 it's almost irreplaceable. This, this, this brings me like a perfect segue into what I wanted to ask. Uh, is Udanta because for years we thought he was the guy who was going to take over the mantle and for the last maybe last year he realized that he stepped up especially last year the year before I think he had a decent decent enough number but never the numbers that would make you go oh what a player he had okay numbers but never great numbers so what this season like you said Leon is there Ashik is there Udanta is there all, all fighting for the same position maybe even Clayton Silva over there so how important is this season for Udanta? Because he needs someone for the national team to step up as well. Yeah, I think, I mean, just as I mentioned how it's tough to replace legends who've been there for many, many years and they're getting on in their years. This is a different case of where it's a player who's, who's not old. He's not too old. He's actually probably coming up close to his peak years. But I think sometimes as a club, you've got to make a decision where is it better to just let the player go? because he might need a fresh start and go somewhere else. And, um, you know, with his attributes, his qualities, he'll walk into most starting lineups in the ISL. Um, Will it serve him better to go somewhere else and get a fresh start and both for himself and for the national team? Will that be good? And also, sometimes as clubs, you've got to think, you know, let's cut our losses early because the way the game's going, is it better to get a transfer fee for him now and let him go to some other club? Because I'm sure a lot of clubs would want him. Rather than if he sees out his contract and then he chooses to move somewhere else, like what Nishu did, 
you've lost a valuable player and you haven't really made anything out of it. And, you know, in the meantime, it's just declining. And if Ashik has a great season and Leon has a great season and Edmund has a great season, then by definition, that means Udanta won't see much game time. And if he then moves on to another club, it doesn't benefit anybody in that way. So I think sometimes clubs have to be a little bit astute and recognise. I think this is something that I think Wenger was very good at at, um, at Arsenal, realising that the utility of a player was declining and he could be better off by getting... And if you can recognise that early on that there's someone in your within your system already who can probably outperform that player, then that's the sort of big calls that clubs have to make. Yeah, I think he's just been given a new three-year deal this thing last year. I think it's a three-year deal. But... Yeah, anyway, that's a discussion for another time. Yeah. Now, moving on to the next team is Chennai. So, the first two teams we spoke about, retaining players, same coach, all those kind of things. Next, the next whole system is uh, new, 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 new coaches all over the place. So, Chennai, new coach. I don't really know much about him personally. They've got some decent new signings, memo and things like that. So, what do you make of them? Do you think they can do... They've re- retained a lot of their... Indian players uh, and Crivellaro and stuff. But do you think they can do what they did last year again? I think sometimes when you you look into a way a club behaved in the off season, and I think they kept their fans hanging for a long time in terms of who's coming in, who's signing, who's retained, um, and that normally gives you a bit of an insight into the fact that there was a little bit of uncertainty in the direction that the club wanted to go, and I think the first want to blink was Owen Coyle and Owen Coyle chose to move on from a team that he had led to the finals and that normally gives you an indication sometimes that all might not be well at the club because for Owen Coyle to choose to leave a club where he knows a lot of the players and he could have strengthened it and choose to go to a club which hasn't qualified must have meant that normally it indicates you know if you're to hazard a guess you'll think they've probably a offered him less money or said you're going to have a smaller budget and I think John Gregory had that after he won the league where he was given a smaller budget than what he had when he won the league. And we saw how what happened. So maybe Owen Coyle, you know, with that hindsight, probably thought it's better to move on. And then if you look at the Indian signings, which are the first ones that they sort of moved on, they seem to have opted for the option of, which I mean, I'm in favour of this, but to promote a lot more of their youth rather than go out and compete in the market for some of the names and get into these astronomical figures that some of the clubs are asking for established players, like as you mentioned, Nishu earlier and, and some others. So they've got a couple of decent players in their youth system, and it's good to see that the youth being given an opportunity. Um, but at the same time, they've, and when they came to the foreign players, they've gone in a completely different direction than majority of the ISL team. So... I don't think they have a single Spaniard in their team, which is unusual at the moment in the ISL. They, no Spanish coach either. No Spanish. Well, they've never had a Spanish coach. So I think that's yeah. par for the course oh. for China. And, you know, they've, they've won it twice. So you can't argue with their, yeah. uh, with their coach strategy. And, their, and if you look at how many coaches they've had over the six seasons, they've only had uh, three coaches. And it's probably, you know, one of the least you know, coach per you know, in turnover in, in the ISL. And... The foreign players that they've brought in again, you know, nobody from. I don't think they brought. I don't think they brought anyone from the A League from Australia. They haven't got any Spaniards, so they've gone in a completely different direction than most of the other teams. And in a way, similarly, last year they did the same. I mean, initially when you looked at the signings of uh, Nelka Valskis and the Crevillaros and and the others, people would have questioned them. And when they were, weren't doing so well in the initial stages, people were questioning the recruitment. But then. In the end of the season, you've got the top scorer, you've got one of the best number 10s in the league. Um, and you can't really argue with uh, with that. And so I think they've balanced it quite well in terms of retaining Crivellaro. That was a good, good player to retain. They retained Eli Sabia, so they've got two key players from last season. And adding Memo, I think, is quite an astute signing because he's versatile and experienced in the league. So you've got three Brazilians there, so you've got quite a good core of um, your foreign players. And... Some of the new signings are quite interesting. I mean, on it may not be well-known names, but when you look at where they've played and what they've done in those leagues, um, they're quite impressive. And uh, it's 
there's no, you know, they, I think they will surprise a few people. Yeah, that team has always been, I've always liked Chennai. I don't know why. I'm not a fan of Chennai, but I always liked, I thought they always did a good job with the players they have. And especially last year, bring a lot of, uh, not a lot, but uh, some Tamil connect as well with Edwin Sydney, they had Ravanan, then Pangani. So those kind of things are also nice, to, good to see. Absolutely. I think that's, I think that's one of their biggest strengths is that they've got the, the local players doing well. And that's, that's what you really want to see. You want to see the likes of um, Edwin Sydney, Dance Paul, as I like to call him, um, after his you know, efforts last season. You know, versatility. He was brilliant. And when they moved him into centre midfield, they got some good young players um, coming through as well. Uh, and, and they give a chance to them. Um, you know, the likes of Tapa were given an opportunity at a young age. So was Jerry. And they've gone on to become national team players and some of them regulars in the national team. So I think it's it's a good sign in terms of the way. That's why I like the direction that the club's gone. Yeah, I think Tapa will be, end up being the equivalent of Dhoni because they take him <laughs> over. So he might be that guy. because he, he is a very good player that they've managed to keep hold of. I know there was a lot of interest in different from different clubs for him. This contract was also ending at the end of last year, but they kept hold on him, so that's a good thing. Yeah, and I think this um, Fatkulo, Fatkulo of the Tajikistan. Yeah, 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 he's quite an impressive credentials in AFC competitions, and you know he could, he definitely could surprise a, a, a few people who probably you know don't really have much expectations on them. I think he could be one that does. Is a surprisingly good player this season. Oh, that's okay. You heard it here first. <laughs> so as I say that, and then uh, let's moving on. So the youngster and the player that you're looking forward to, is this the one that you're looking at? Yeah, well, he's he's. Def- I think the um, the striker that they've the signed from the Portuguese league. Um, he's definitely one that I think, in terms of their players, that's gone under the radar a bit. Um, Isma. Mm. He's one that I've got a, a, hopes to see, you know, because he's filling big boots. He's coming in and replacing the league's top scorer in, over there. But he's one that I'll probably be keeping a, um, a close eye on. And in terms of young players, it's Abhijit Sarkar, uh, young player. He's been doing pretty well in preseason, and a lot of um, reviews from, you know, you speak to people inside inside the camps and who know about it. And he's the one that's been doing really well. So I've got some little bit of a Keep a close eye on this kid. Uh, okay. So, uh, moving on to the next team is FC Goa. Yep. New, completely shaken up, uprooted completely, changed everything. Edu Bedia is the old loan foreign survivor. A lot of the Indian players also, a couple of them, big ones left. All the foreigners. It's just, they had to do everything all over again at the worst possible time. So, how are you looking at them? Do you think they can push? for another uh, title. So this is what we sort of were saying as the different way of doing it when you need to change because players are getting too old and they've been there and it's getting a bit stale and you need to freshen up the squad. This is the other option of doing it, which is make wholesale changes. You change the coach, you change um, five out of your six foreign players and you even change, you lose your captain as well, your Indian, most capped Indian player. But... Normally, you'd say it's a bit of a high-risk strategy, but you've seen teams do this, but normally they do it when the team's not successful. Like, um, like Habas rebuilt the team last season because the team wasn't performing well, and similarly with some of the others. But um, I think what the advantage that they have, if you look at it at the back, Serotin's still there. They've got... Navaz is still there, so they've got two of the back five, you could say, from last season that are still there. In terms of losing the two centre backs, you know, if you lose Murtada Fall and Carlos Pena, you've got James Donerkey and Ivan Gonzalez, who are actually probably two genuine, I mean, they're genuine centre backs. So you've got two proper centre backs over there. So I think that could be, if they can develop a partnership, really good for them at the back. Um, they had this kid Sanson Pereira coming through their youth system to compete with Savio Gama. So in terms of left backs, they've this is definitely an upgrade on having a makeshift left back, which Manda was. Mm. So I think they're not, so you know, on paper, it's actually quite, you could say they're an improvement at the back. And then, you, you know, you move into midfield, obviously, 
anyone who's watched Arsenal over the last couple of years is going to say, you've lost Jahu, you've lost probably one of the best players in the league. Um, but Edu Badia can probably slot into that position and play as that sort of playmaker coming, playing in a little bit deep. Lenny will still give them that um, ability that they have. He's He's been retained. And I think with the likes of Princeton coming in and really impressing for them last season, he's probably one of their most impressive to come through their squad, the developmental squad. He's knocking on the door. So him and Brandon and Lenny, you've got three really good Indian midfielders over there. And then... Goals as well. And they're going as well. So you're definitely going to get... That's also good to see in terms of... It's a state that does produce a lot of good footballers and hasn't produced that many national team players. And I think Princeton's one of those who probably could knock on the door in a few years' time. Um, and then I think they've been astute in the way they've gone with their midfielders. They haven't gone for people who are going to compete with one another like was in the past um, in going teams. And they've got um, this guy, Alberto Noguera. And by all accounts, some people are saying, listen, this guy is as good, if not better, than um, uh, Lanzarote was for, for Goa. So if he can deliver those kind of numbers in terms of goals and assists, then you've got a massive upgrade on, um, on the squad last year. And Igor Angulo, the striker, obviously, you know, everyone's going to compare him from minute one to uh, Koro uh, mm. because of the goals that Koro scored. And uh, he's, he's come in and said, yeah, you know, I, I'll relish this pressure. And he's been scoring for fun in preseason. He scored in every game he's played, I think. But, I mean, the, irrespective of whether he scores as many as Koro or doesn't score as many as Koro, I think what you should really judge him on at the end of the season is silverware. I mean, that's mm. how you judge, judge players. And for all of Koro's goal-scoring exploits, you know, he walked away with a golden boot two, two out of the three seasons over here, but Goa didn't pick up any guy mm -hmm. in any of, those, any of those seasons. So that, that's where you ultimately judge these players. And again, they're one of the teams that have to play in Asia, and not just play in Asia, they have to play in the Asian Champions League. Yeah. So you need players who, who can compete at that level. And I think that's why the likes of Donica, you've got an Australian defender who can play in that position, will play in that position in the AFC Cup. And you've got more Indian depth as well. So the likes of uh, Redeemed Lang and then mm. Makan, Winkle, Chote, those guys, you probably start seeing them getting a lot more games, maybe towards as we're going closer to the Asian competition, so they start bedding themselves into the team. I think they'll definitely be competitive, um, judging by preseason results, which I know you can't read too much into preseason and, and everything, but they'll definitely be contenders for the top four. I don't think it's it's a rebuilding year for them. I think it's a, it is a rebuilding year, but you don't, uh, it's not like they have to write this off as a rebuilding year. I think it's a rebuilding year where they can still challenge for challenge for the top. Yeah, from what I heard, and a couple of players also told me this, that uh, Ferrando, who is a new coach, he has... His apparently his training sessions are much more intense, and uh, he has uh, plans for them in terms of attacking and defending. Like there are choreographed things that they're working on, and they said it's a different. Ex like under Lobera, that was not the case. The Edubedia actually said, it, "Lobera, let us do what we were good at." This guy wants us to do the other side, and he admitted probably the fact that they did not have a plan B, or they did not know what to do when things are not going their way, or Let's say they're playing a BFC. They set up to stop Goa. Them scoring is a secondary thing, but they set up to stop Goa playing that uh, the way they want to play. And he's admitted that probably that is where they lacked and that's why they didn't win the silver. So he's full dung ho about the new coach as well. Yeah, I think I've, I've heard similar things that what you've heard about the fact that, you know, they're actually learning how to defend now, which in the past three years, <laughs> it was, you know, they just relied on individuals to defend as opposed to defending as a team. The suggestion uh, didn't. <laughs> uh, it's um, it'll be interesting to see. That's why I think they'll be a lot stronger. I mean, a lot of people won't be expecting them to be as strong. So, but I actually think they'll be quite strong. Yeah, I am with you there. So, the youngster and the one player that you're looking for. I think I mentioned uh, a couple of the youngsters, the likes of Princeton, um, Samson. Um, one I'd like to see get opportunity, but I doubt it, just because of the players and the position he plays is Frankie. Um, to see how mm. he does at this level. But I'm not sure he'll he'll get that many minutes. So I'll probably have to stick with um, Princeton in terms of 
youngsters and definitely keen to see how uh, Angulo Angulo the works for them. Yeah, because I I think for instance too because that club is very high on him. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. And uh, now it's Hyderabad FC that we're looking at. Again, uh, new coach say changed the coach before he actually came here. So all that drama on the side. What do you make of them? Because they I mean, haven't that, made any waves. Normal. I think that's par for the course for the club that was formerly known as... FC Pune City? Yeah, where, you know, you bring a coach and then change the coach before the season starts. Um, so, I mean, if you look at... I was doing some analysis on this. and If you look at clubs over the last six years of the ISL, so the last six seasons, and... Although even the likes of FC Go and Chennai have had seasons where they finish at the bottom, um, and you know Hyderabad and Pune have never, re- I mean, um, finished right. I mean, they finished, last year they finished at the bottom, but if you look at their average performances over the last six seasons, both in terms of where they finish at the table, and then in terms of win percentage or points per game, and then you, you add all these factors in together, and you get a picture of. You know how people normally say, oh, the league table doesn't lie. Over the course of a long Mm -hmm. season, the league table doesn't lie. So I think you use the same analogy with clubs that over four or five seasons now, six seasons now, if you judge them on six seasons' performances, they're probably what you could say are a relegation contender at the start of the season. And obviously every club goes into a season thinking, oh, the season's going to be different. Um, And I think if you look at their signings, they definitely made some signings of intent. Like Aridane, I think, is a top, top striker, good number nine, suits the way the game's played over here and brings others into the game. He's not a selfish striker that just plays up there. He's willing to drop into a number 10. And I really like, I liked him last season. And you brought in another quite impressive player in terms of both his work rate and how he, how he works is um, the Australian um, Joel Kianese. And Joel's versatile as well. In a way, a bit similar to Aridane, where he plays, you know, he can play as a nine holding up the ball and everything, but he can also, you can also use him wide or off of the striker. So, if you go with a four foot two, then the two strikers are a little bit too similar. But they've got good, good, two good attacking players, which I think they were missing last season. My only concern then would be when you have such good attackers, you need someone to provide service to them. And if you look amongst their squad, the midfielders that they've got, the likes of um, Luis Sastre and Xiao um, Victor, both of them are what you could probably put into that bracket of midfielders rather than creative midfielders. So you start to question where's the creativity going to come from? You know, is it going to be a list, you know, is a list of glass going to have to feature in a, in a tent kind of position or is it Yasi, Sheikh Halder? Where's that? spark of creativity coming from and ironically probably the one foreign player that they had which who was creative and you could say is a good attacking midfielder is the one that hasn't joined is on their foot <laughs> but has not joined their preseason. it's uh, Nesta Gordia so that's you know it's little things like this that you know you've got a player who's registered with you or sorry signed with you he's on your books but he's not with you in preseason, and you've opted not to bring in another foreigner in a position where you do need somebody. So I think it's little things like that where you start to question the the club management or the, the way they're thinking. I mean, are, are they thinking clearly in terms of how, they, how they're going to approach this season? And again, it's not only have you made a change in the head coach, you've made a change in, in the assistant coach. So there's very little continuity from last season. Um, the only continuity, obviously, is the player, the Indian players, the likes of Adil... And a couple of the boys, obviously, who've come in from the Pune days, the likes of, um, as I mentioned, Abhishek Haldar, uh, Ashish Rai, and the others. And they've lost key Indian personnel, I think. Um, I think in, over, over the years, if you look at the likes of Sartar Golway, who's gone on national team players, playing for Mumbai now. Uh, come up, goalkeeper's gone, moved to Odisha. You've lost key players for me. And the kind of replacements... It's not really what you'd say uh, taking them in the right direction. You know, signing the likes of a Subrata Paul or a Katimani is not necessarily what you'd call 
a forward-thinking club's decision. Um, but that said, I like some of the. I like the fact that they've gone after Chingleton. That's positive signing because you're getting a good Indian youngster. Um, I just hope he gets to play because you've got Adil now who wants to play as a centre back for the national team. You've got a Spanish defender in on India, and uh, you got you got to start to wonder whether he'll actually get any any game time in that position when if he's competing with those two. So. Yeah, that is a club who uh, I don't really understand a lot out of. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. and, uh, I was trying to make sense of it, but it, it's very difficult to make sense of a lot of the stuff that they do. Yeah. Uh, now the, the other team is Jamshedpur that I was looking. Oh, by the way, the youngster and the one that you're looking at. Yeah, I think Kianes is definitely one that I'm uh, looking forward to seeing how he performs for them. Um, in terms of youngsters, there's this defender there called Nikhil Prabhu, who I think he's got a lot of potential and um, be interesting to see how he does because I can't keep saying Liston anymore because he's no longer that young and he's been around for a while. Yeah. Um, so I think Nikhil Prabhu is the one, but I, I just can't see how he'll get too much game time at the moment. So now it's Jamshedpur that I wanted to look at. Mm-hmm. Again, new coach. But uh, the big, it's the biggest. Whenever I, I we did a podcast with uh, Owen Coyle as well, which came mm-hmm. out. Uh, yeah, I just said, yeah, I was yeah, to so, that. yeah. So one of the things he said is to build the mentality of a winning team because Jamshedpur has not been a team that has challenged for titles. How difficult is that as a coach when you come in? See, I think I heard what Owen Coyle said, and you know, he's obviously going to say that. He signed for a two-year contract, and you know he, he's very clever in his choice of words and how he how he speaks. But I mean, it's a strange signing for me, for him to opt for that club, and because I just think if you want to win something in India, is that probably the right club to go to? Uh, just because of the way they've done things in the past couple of seasons, and the way they've gone about things this season, you've you look through their squad and. You know, they've retained a lot of players like Aitha Monroy and um, David Grande. And he said, you know, were they their best performers last season? So, you, you've just, not really. I, I don't think they were. And, you know, obviously the likes of PT and... Um, Sergio Castell. Yeah, Sergio Castell. Those guys were their best performers. And they've not been retained. And you've gone after, and but you've retained some of the others. Now, obviously, if you, you know it's not going to be easy to retain the likes of a PT and Sergio Castell. And you've replaced. You could say, you could argue that yes, they've replaced Castell with Valskis. And the question is, have they replaced the, the PT in terms of what he would offer them? And I'm not sure about that. And then, if you looked at their squad over the last season, you could probably say, despite having those two, they were a little bit light in the Indian player department. And their best Indian player last season was Farooq. Who's gone to Mumbai. Who's gone to Mumbai. Again, you could argue that they replaced him with Jackie. But mm. you replaced a young, up-and-coming mobile Indian forward in Farooq with probably someone who's at the other end of his career, coming to his last few years of his career. And although he had a good season, at um, a good couple of years at Goa, I think he's probably, you know, his star's probably on the wane at the moment. So I think their Indian squad's a little bit weak. A lot of them are players that you'd have in your club as your bench players. You know, they all make good number twos in every position. But I'm not sure if they're necessarily number ones in their position. And that's in every position, from goalkeeper to, you know, to, to a lot of other positions. So I think they're a little bit lightweight in their Indian personnel. They're a little bit lightweight in terms of what they've retained in their foreign personnel. So there's a lot of pressure on the likes of Valskis, um, Alex Lima, who's come in, and Peter Hartley, and John and Fitzgerald, the Australian. So a lot of these guys will really have to step up their game if they're going to keep Jamshedpur from a, being the sort of perennial fifth place team. I mean, that's what they've almost become now, right? They're just sort of mid table yeah. team. So. Because one of the things I was wondering is, uh, I had a similar thought when I looked at the goalkeeper. Thought that department, all three or four of them were not up to par. 
uh, but they have a lot of youngsters narendra sir uh, amarjit jitender aniket whatever age he is so yeah. all these people <laughs> are there and from when i was talking to some of them i spoke to uh, amarjit and uh, jitender the other day and uh, the club was looking at jacky to be that indian guy who has played at the final level and hello yeah just yeah lost you there yeah you're saying yeah. that jacky as a player to be the role model is it yeah so see if he can so what do you think about that that's what i hear from I mean, you, some of them you've lost subrata paul both in terms of a goalkeeper and in terms of a sort of senior indian player and a leader and if you're expecting jacky to come in and take over that role as a as a leader anybody who knows jacky or has seen jacky over the last 10 years will know that he's not that kind of a character in the dressing room or in training um you know he's a good he's a nice chap he's a nice nice lad he you know he, good jovial guy is quite funny actually and yeah, very humble guy uh, yeah yeah but lovely guy works hard in terms of he put his shift in works hard for the team and does his job but he's not that kind of galvanizing personality who's going to bring everyone together and 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 do that and the risk when you've got so many youngsters the likes of uh, narendra jitu um, and a lot of these promising youngsters is you need a sort of guiding hand with them both in terms of either the coaching staff or in terms of the management uh, and more than more often than not it's better if you have it from a senior indian pro or a couple of senior indian pros and i think they've lost that they don't really have any senior indian players there who can who've been there done it and can be that vocal presence both in the dressing room and training and and to give these guys that kind of guidance that they need um so i think that's that's going to be their biggest weakness and from what i'm hearing already i, th- I think still two of their players are still in quarantine Mm. so that's some issues in terms of how they late recruitment or visas whatever it is so i think it'll be a, they'll start slow i think just because just because of these reasons and because again it's the same thing with hyderabad like although on call is not new to indian football he hasn't really had a full season yet in india so i'm not sure he'll know of the strengths and weaknesses of all the indian players as well as somebody who has been here for let's say 4 or 5 years secondly they don't have an assistant coach who's got that much experience i think noel wilson's come in as the um assistant coach it's his first season in the isl he doesn't have much experience as a he's never been a head coach anywhere as a with a club team so i don't think they have that expertise in terms of how to build a good indian squad and that could come back to sort of haunt them probably so who's the young guy you're looking forward to um I quite liked um the way Narendra Gelot played last season. I think he just didn't get get enough opportunity. So I'd like to see him see how he he performs um this season. And I think in terms of the foreign players the sort of Peter Hartley is meant to be quite an impressive defender I think he'll be one that probably is the one that's going to have a quite a busy role this season for them. So now we are into the episode 2. So okay. that's the first half. So okay. in the second episode, we start with your let's favorite. Let's start. Yeah, absolutely. Let's start with Kerala Blasters like sure. <laughs> so I'll, I I I'll tell you about the observation couple of them that I've made. I think the coach is with what they've done with the coach is quite decent. The keeper we can now knows the league a little bit as one in Mohun Bagan. Don't know if he can replicate it in Kerala's conditions. the condition i mean you know the club conditions uh, i think in goalkeeping they have improved with albino coming in from what they had last year and nishu obviously going purely by last year's performance i think is a decent signing although i didn't know why they needed to sign another left back they had uh, rohatara and they had uh, rakib rakib i think went uh, jessel on the other side so i thought their wing backs were okay i don't know why they had to sign nishu but uh, anyway changed all the foreigners again mm-hmm. and uh, again it seems like they are starting from scratch again like they do every single year 
Yeah, I mean, Kerala glasses is one of those enigmas. It's just just when you think, okay, this is they've now learned from their mistake of last season. They're going to change, and you look to the initial reaction of the club. They were re- they retained Bart, they retained Sido, um, they look to be in the market for Thierry, who is a vastly experienced uh, centre back in Indian football in, in the ISL, and you know, they made a the marquee signing in Nishu. So you think, okay, this is going to be a good season. They've got um, a good tech a sporting director who's come in who seems to be calling the shots. And he brought in um, Kibo Vicuna. And you now, in terms of coaching personnel, I actually think, I mean, it's like I'm, I'm starting to wonder, it's like, whatever happened to retaining coaches? I mean, just because you missed out, you're probably more likely to succeed if you keep the same coach because he probably knows a lot more about where it went wrong and he can address those issues. Whereas, the moment you keep chopping and changing, which is what they've done, if you look at how many coaches they've had in the last seven, six seasons, is you're starting from zero every single time. You're not starting from, look, even though you didn't get to, let's say, 10 last year, you might have just finished short. You, you, you finished, let's say, on a scale of 1 to 10, you finished 4. But if you retain the coach, you're picking up from that same spot. Whereas you start from a new coach, you're always starting from scratch. And... Again, it's some of the things like we spent, mentioned with another club. It's just confusing in a way, in a way why, why they would do what they did. Now, obviously, goalkeeping was a concern and you need to address it. If you're spending the kind of money that they were spending with Nishus and, and some of the others, you've got a question, why not get a top goalkeeper? So you're building from the back, get a good goalkeeper. Albino, a couple of seasons ago, was probably top three or four goalkeepers in India. But he hasn't played for two seasons. He's been injured. And it's not as if he's been, I'm not saying an injury is a, is a death sentence and you shouldn't sign an injured player, but has he, is he capable of competing? Because it's taken a long time to come back from that ACL injury. So you've got question marks over whether he can last a season. You know, have they seen him playing out from the back? Because you've signed a coach who's adamant on playing out from the back. And with Bilal Khan, lovely kid, Bilal, you know, up has potential to be a good goalkeeper, but playing out of the back is not his strength. He doesn't want the back pass. And we saw that last season, even with, with Elko. So, question marks. And then you've got Prabhsuk and Gill, who, again, isn't really a top-flight goalkeeper yet. So, automatically, you're starting to look, are they actually better than they were last season in that department? Then, if you look at the centre-backs, um, you know, I think both... Um, the defenders last season, they've obviously gone on for Zoe and they've moved on. And you've got in somebody like Bakari Kone and um, Costa, who look to be upgrades from last season. So if they choose to play with both those foreign centre-backs, I think then they'll be okay. If they don't and try and do what they've been doing in pre-season, which is trying to play out from the back with the likes of uh, Haku and, and others, I think they're going to get stuck. Um, because teams will press and teams will figure them out. And th- these kids are, you know, they're good defenders. You can, you can hide them in a, in a back four as a right back and get away with it. Um, but if you rely on them primarily as your center backs throughout the season, I think you'll have more problems than not. And then you go further into midfield again. For me, if I was talking, if you were to give me, the top three foreign players for last season for Kerala Blasters. I don't think Sido would be in that. Uh, he he played a lot of games because a lot of the others were injured, but wouldn't be he didn't stand out in, in anything that he did particularly. And so again, you've retained a player who probably wasn't your best of your foreign players. You know, by far, but Ogbeche was their best player. Um, Messi Bully was the enigma, but he he delivered. And I think Zuivelin was also key when he was fit and available. So it doesn't really make much sense in that respect. But, you know, it's good to have some continuity. And, you know, he's a solid player. Don't get me wrong. He's not a bad player. Then when it comes to the Indians, you've got the sort of conundrum now. With You've, you've signed some creative players like Pereira and Vincente Gomez. And you've got Sido. All these guys who play in that same position where fan favorite Sahal needs to play. Yeah. And, again, if you look at, performances last season, Sahal wasn't the best Indian midfielder for them. I thought Jeekson did very well in the games that he played. And and even 
at times when Sam Mueller came on, he did quite well. So you've signed. <clears throat> so again, why why go and sign players like Rohit Kumar when you've got foreign players in that position? You're not playing in Asia. You've got Sahal. You've got Jixen. So I don't really understand some of the signings um, in in that respect. And Puite as well as another one who's an upgrade on all of those players. And if you look at last couple of seasons' performances, so. Where they do have strength, I think going forward they've got some decent players. As Gary Hooper's a good good signing, scored in preseason yesterday, and from all accounts, <clears throat> he's he's a proper hard working centre forward, and they'll they'll definitely be a threat. My concerns are what you mentioned earlier about the coach is, yeah, he had a good season at Mohun Bagan, but Mohun Bagan he had time to build his team. He had time, you know, you've got. You have a lot, of, lot more time with the Kolkata League, with Durand Cup. You've got to get your philosophies in. And then when you come to the I-League, if you've got good foreign players, you, you can do well with that. He hasn't brought in any of those foreign players with him. Which so, you know, makes you question. And some of them have ended up at, like, obviously, Fran Gonzalez has ended up at um, mm-hmm. BFC, Bengaluru. So he hasn't brought in any of those. Hasn't really brought in that many of his Indian uh, players either. I uh, thought, you know, you, you'd think that... So it just makes you question whether he's on the same page as his sporting director or, or whoever's in charge of the Indian recruitment at the club. Because he's got a coach in one country and he moves to... And he doesn't take a single player. It's, which means, again, he's starting from zero. So now he's got to get all these players playing the way he, he would like them to play. Because if it's, it's not like he's inheriting a team where a lot of them last season so you can just say okay put these players in and then we'll play the way we did because it's a new left back in Nishu if Nishu plays in Jessel's position it's a new goalkeeper it's new centre backs so everything has to be coached from scratch and I think that's where with the disjointed pre-season that everybody seems to be having I think as I heard of yesterday they've still got three players in quarantine one might be out today so we're one week away from the opener I mean I'm sorry nine days away from Playing ATK, Monbagan. So you you want <laughs> need, need your players out on the field, not not still in quarantine. So that's that's what I think could be their undoing at the start of the season, and maybe hope to recover. So yeah, and in terms of your uh, young player, I'd like to see. Shaibor Lankarpan get some game time. I think in the reserves and in second division, he's always looked impressive. And, and um, you know, we're always looking for young Indian forwards who can do well. He's definitely one that, given the opportunities, will do well. Um, and in terms of, I think, the foreign players, I think Gary Hooper is the one that I've probably got my eye most on. Okay. I have a personal soft spot towards Arjun Jairaj. Because he's from Gokulam. Okay. Uh, but I'm not sure if uh, last year he, I think he had an injury or something, like a serious yeah. injury. Right, so they didn't register him. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, look, they've got a couple of good young Indian lads over there. I think, um, I think, Nong, I think Nong Domba is the only one that um, yeah. Kibu's brought with him from Mohan Bagan. So he probably get more game time than somebody else. So he's someone that could perform. But also, I mean, like, having a Nong Domba there will put pressure on Praveen's and others to perform. And, you know, Puite as well, if he gets a lot of consistent game time, he, he could be one that does really well too. I think he was impressive in Northeast two seasons ago. Yeah. So, from a coach who didn't take any of their players to a coach who took half his team with him, <laughs> uh, let's go to Mumbai City, Sergio Lovera. We're moving well from one team to another with these segues, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, very good squad on paper. On paper. Yes. At absolutely. least by name. Um, I don't know anything about uh, Sai Godard, but everybody seems to be mad about uh, how good he is. Uh, Adam Lefondre, Ogbeche. How, are they, how is he ever going to fit all of them in the same time, in the same place? Because Ogbeche plays with Lefondre, has both strikers, and uh, Lobera has never played with two strikers. True. Um, I think the easy and obvious one would have been to say, yeah, he's going to play with a 4-4-2 diamond which is, you know, he'll play 
Jahu at the base of the diamond and then Bumu at the apex of it. And in front of Bumu would be La Fondra and Urbeche. Now that would probably sh send shivers down the spine of any opposition defender if that's the lineup you're facing. If you, if someone says we saw a bit and these three or four are definitely starting, you'd be you'd be getting nervous because you know then Bumu's playing in between the lines. He's he's free, and you got two lethal strikers. So you're going to keep your back four and your defensive midfielder, so probably your back five, and you you know very very busy. But it's the balance I think is where they might come unstuck because if he goes with that kind of a formation and the question is you know that's already four of his five foreigners then he can only afford one more which is probably going to be Murtada Fall at the back now who do you play alongside Murtada Fall we've seen with Libero's teams in the past when he's gone with an Indian centre-back alongside a foreign centre-back they've always been susceptible to concede and when his team started to do a little bit better defensively it was when he had Carlos Peña and Murtada Fall playing together. He doesn't have that luxury over here because um, Hernan Santana is a midfielder. Um, I think unless he's going to convert either Jahu or Santana to play centre back, he can't really play. With, he can't play with two foreign centre backs because he doesn't have them in his squad. If he goes with an Indian centre back, again, if you're looking at his squad, the only ones who come to mind are. Sartak Golui and Mehtab Singh. And Sartak's played 50-50 you know, half at centre-back, half at right-back over the last couple of seasons. Although he's, in the long run, will make a good centre-back. Um, and I don't think Mehtab's quite ready for this level just yet. I mean, he'll get there one day. Then if you look at their full-backs, okay, Rakip's good going forward, and you've got Mandar, who's probably going to play on the left. And from the last preseason game, Pranjal Bumic played out as a right back. So again, it's Lovera being, you know, I'll make a right back rather than I don't need to have one. He's, he's quite happy with his right back being more attacking than necessarily defensive abilities. So whilst they, without a doubt, this team will be one of the top scorers in the league. Mm. But the question is how many clean sheets can they keep? And I think that could be their undoing. If they can't, organize themselves properly at the back. So he might revert back to a 4-2-3-1, in which case Ogbeche and Lafondre, one of them will have to be on the bench. And But it's a dangerous bench. Imagine when you're making substitution, one of them is coming on. Um, so they're definitely going to be a threat. They're definitely going to be contenders for the top four spot and one of the favorites to, to pick up the trophy at the end of the season. But I think if teams can figure them out and get into that sort of soft underbelly that is their defence. I think we're going to have a lot of... It'll probably be the most exciting team to watch. There'll be a lot of 4-3 kind of games. But let me... This thing with Rubera, Libera is... I, I personally don't think he can win the title. He can win the league. I don't know if he can win the title. Because eventually it comes down to... He was going to, you, you, you don't need, you always know how he's going to play in a certain yeah. way. And sooner or later, a team like ATK or BFC who are defensively inclined and transition, playing on transition and things like that, they'll come and figure you out, especially in the knockouts. I mean, there was 11 goals against Chennai in the knockouts last year in the semifinals. Absolutely. That's ridiculous. Think, absolutely. I mean, there's no doubt. Um, and don't forget, this is a longer season now with... Um, SC East Bengal coming in, now you've got 11 teams, so it automatically becomes a longer season. The longer the seasons are, teams like this, as you said, coaches will figure them out. And it's not just, I mean, if a team can figure them out in a knockout, you'll figure them out in the league because some of these teams and coaches play the same way irrespective of whether it's a knockout game, whether it's a um, first game of the season or seventh game or tenth or mid last game of the season. And it takes us back to what Edu Badia said, if there isn't that much of a focus on defence and other teams are focusing on it, they could probably figure out teams like this and they might not necessarily have such an easy ride uh, to the top of the table. Yeah. Let's just hope uh, some people in Mumbai, this sparks the interest again in Mumbai because from what I hear last couple of years, it's not been that great. 
Yeah, I mean, in terms of it'll, be, they will be one of the most exciting teams to watch this season. Uh, sadly, there's no fans um, in the game at the stadiums. Otherwise, this would be the match that everyone would want to go and watch. Um, you're definitely going to get excitement. Uh, you're going to get goals. But I think it'd probably be, you know, you need to be glued to your TV seat. This is going to be one of those tune in watch. <laughs> You'll definitely get goals in this game. You won't be any nil nils when they, these guys are playing. Um, yeah. But, and I think, again, to get to the players to watch, Adam Lafondre looks a really, really good striker. I mean, he was second behind Roy Krishna two seasons ago in the A League. So this guy knows knows where the back of the net is, and um, I'm sure he'll be trying to sort of prove his credentials um, right from the get go. And he, he's been scoring in preseason again as well, so he's he's fit, he's sharp, and raring to go. Um, and in terms of the youngsters, they got a few, but the question is which one's going to get a chance. I mean, you can't really see the likes of a soccer getting too many minutes or the likes of uh, Vidyananda getting too many minutes and even although Vikram Pratap's been signed and there's a lot of hype about him I can't see him um, getting too many minutes so I think in their team it could be somebody like a Valpuya somebody at the back or a Sartak Golui who might end up being the one as a young player who catches catches the eye the most yeah so let's go from this exciting team to another one which is coming in with a lot of excitement. Mm-hmm. Uh, East Bengal. Okay. So, I actually was pleasantly surprised yesterday when I saw the result they had because I thought, you know, um, not having a preseason properly, maybe a week and a half lesser than others, sort of came in last minute into the league in itself. And I didn't think their players, their squad looks that great because a lot of them, JJ, Valvand, Vinit, Eugene, didn't have great seasons in the last, let's say, two years, three years. And they all sort of have to find their own. Either they have to show that they're still as good as they were or this is maybe they're on the way now, whatever. That's what I was thinking. So what do you make of that team now? With Robbie Fowler, again, an experienced coach in India. Yeah, I mean, if you'd asked me this yesterday, I probably would have, both of us would be exactly on the same page because it's, you know, they've had the shortest preseason compared to everybody. They've probably picked up a lot of players after a lot of clubs had already signed them. So you've ended up with players that other clubs have opted not to sign in terms of Indian players. But with that said, I think Bengaluru FC, we proved it in 2013-14 that you can win the league with players that other clubs have opted not to sign. Because there's a lot of good players that clubs miss for whatever reasons, whatever preconceived notions and, and everything. So people might think that a JJ, a Balwant, a Eugene, uh, Narayan Das, etc. are all, uh, CK Vineet, Senad Singh, these guys are all over the hill, Mohamed Rafiq, etc. But, and Devjit, let's not forget, these are all, I've just pr- pretty much listed about an almost an entire Indian team lineup. All these guys have represented India. So you can't take away that experience that they have. And you again, you just mentioned those same names again, Devjit, Gurtej, Rafiq, I'm sorry, maybe not Rafiq, maybe not Rafiq, JJ, Balwant, Eugene. They've all won the league. They've yeah. all got high league winners medals. So they've all, you know, been part of championship winning teams and CK as well. So you've got experienced players who are obviously very good footballers as well. Now, if you can get them fit, get good rotation. So, and this is with senior players sometimes, maybe they're not going to give you 20 games in the season. But if you can get 10 good games out of them and rotate them wisely so you can get the best out of their aging bodies and legs, and then balance that with some of the good youngsters like Yumnam Gopi Singh, who scored yesterday, um, and some of the other pretty impressive young players that they've got. They've got a couple of other young guys who are there or thereabouts. Um, then you could get start upsetting a few teams. I mean, I wouldn't even think it's an upset because, you know, it's a big club. And, you know, again, if you look at performances over the past six years, this is a team that's always there in the top four, the leagues that they play in. They're always contending for the title. They just always blow it. You know, they're almost like the, like the South African cricket team of, um, of Indian football. 
you know, they just choke. And you've now got good management. And although Robbie Fowler might be new to Indian football, what he's done, which is pretty astute, is he brought a lot of his staff from Brisbane with him. Mm. People who he's worked with. And he's brought a lot of players that he's worked with in the past. So although it's new in terms of the country and he, he'll have a lot of continuity to his squad. And, you know, we expected him to play with a back three yesterday. He did play with a back three yesterday. And they looked impressive right from the get-go. They, they put, granted, it wasn't the strongest Kerala Blasters team. But by the same token, it wasn't the strongest um, SE East Bengal team either. They were missing um, players. But, you know, two out of his three centre-backs are going to be foreign. That automatically gives you a massive advantage in Indian football. He, he'll have three out of his, most probably three out of his, you know, he'll have three players in his midfield and one as a, as a striker, probably, up front also. In some kind of, there'll be three in that area of the field. So there'll definitely be a threat going forward. And whatever people might want to say about JJ and Balwant or whatever, the guys have delivered and they can score goals. And, you know, with good players around them, they will be a tough team to break down, I think. And, They've just got that grit and another team that doesn't have any Spanish players in them. So there'll certainly be a certain competitiveness about them um, to, you know, make it that cliched sort of thing. But, you know, these players will have a point to prove. They'll probably try and say, listen, you might, you guys might play that particular style of play, but we'll, you know, we'll play a different way that will beat you. So I'm really looking forward to their games. And I think having them in the league is fantastic. Although there's no crowds this year, um, hmm. if and when we do get back to having crowds I mean watching them against ATK and Mohan Bagan in at Salt Lake will be the sort of ticket that everybody wants yeah, Absolutely I'm also very happy that they're there I'm not a big fan of the team and the management as such but yeah I think I think that team is no, I think see, for especially team. I think like even Bengaluru I'm sure Bengaluru FC people don't want you know I'm not too happy that East Bengal's in with them because if you look at the results over the years they've always been there sort of <laughs> Another one of their bogey teams like Mumbai like used to Mumbai, be. Mumbai, yeah. And the, what I think it's, it's a good sign that clubs that have done well in the I-League and have this tremendous fan support, if they can you know, fulfill the credentials and come into the ISL. Because look, in a few years' time, if Gokulam can come into the ISL. That would be amazing. That would just be, it's great for Indian football. Then you'll have, you, you've got this derby in Calcutta, you've got that derby in um, Kerala. And these are genuine derbies, not the sort of, you know, yeah, different. absolutely. And where you'll genuinely start having people from a certain part of Kerala saying, yeah, this is the team we support, that's the team they support. And even youngsters will grow up saying, I want to play for this team or I want to play for that team. And that's only, that's only going to be better for Indian football. So I think it's a good sign. It's a sign that we're moving eventually in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, there's no competition. Gokulam is a better team. Uh, their jersey is better. So even right there. So... Uh, that's that's just uh, that's the fan talking, but exactly. But that but that's what you want. You want that kind of fan rivalry. That's just you know it gives you so much hype even before the match is played. As I said, yesterday was a preseason friendly behind closed doors, and we had so many words. We had a four two. We had three ones coming in. We had Bal one score. We said no. It was Gopi who scored. No, it was Jacques Mogamo who scored. And this is all because you've got so much of a fan following that all these internet, WhatsApp, and all sorts of rumors are flowing because it was Kerala Blasters versus SC East Bengal. So it was great that you, in a preseason match, you can have so much hype that even us in lock, you know, we're in quarantine in a room and we're exchanging and predictive lineups and everything like that. Um, so imagine what it's going to be like once we can actually get to see them all play. So very, yeah, very exciting. Yeah. So right, let's sorry. go from. Two that, players, two players. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, yeah. Um, I think the um, from what I've gathered, I spoke to a couple of the lads at the team. They said Pilkington, the midfielder, he is raring to go. He's super competitive. He's um, ready. He's pumped, and he's someone to keep you know watch out for definitely. In terms of youngsters, they don't have too many in their team. It's a lot of more experienced players. But I think Gopi Singh, and I'm not just saying that because he scored yesterday, um, but I think Gopi's one to watch for this season. Yeah. Absolutely. So now let's go to a couple of clubs where maybe the hype is not the same, mm -hmm. but uh, hopefully they can build. Let's start with Northeast United FC. New coach, Gerard Ness, 
and i don't know much about him i don't think he's ever been a head coach before i'm not uh, very sure so uh, does is that going to come and uh, bite them in the ass now um well you know we've had a coach who's never been a head coach before and carlos quadrad go on to win the league so you know it's i don't think we should dismiss coaches who um who are on the first step of the their coaching journey in their life um based on that i think the bigger issue is similar to what hyderabad what we mentioned it's again it's you know i'm not basing this on this season it's over the past six seasons it's a club that are perennial and you know relegation candidates if there was a relegation because of again over the past six seasons the way they've on average finished last on average have the lowest points per game have the lowest win percentage over the last six seasons so what's to say that this season's going to be another exception like they had two seasons ago and again you look at the way the quiet in the off season didn't really do much so in terms of their indian players they've gone after players that probably they couldn't go after the ones that east bengal won after because of the price tags but they've opted to go for a mixture of some unknown gems and some northeastern players who are probably under the radar or under the value um and i think that that's where you see the obvious weakness i don't think they've got any stand out um, indian players um i think apart from you know one or two kids um like apoya was really good last season that midfielder he's one that I hope he gets more opportunities in them and then if you look at their foreigners i mean have they retained anyone yes they probably retained the best one and this is a surprise to me that no one else has gone after him i think um Federico Gallego was one two seasons ago was absolutely brilliant um with uh, with Ogbeche um I think he was coming back from injury last year we didn't see the best of him so this season will be a true test of whether he has actually fully recovered from that injury or whether you know he's 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 not the player he used to be prior to the injury that horrific injury he had um I don't really know too much and I haven't seen too much about their foreign contingent the Gane and striker seems to be their focal point of attack Kwesi Apia Apia everything in the pre-season game yesterday against Jamshed where everything was played into him um and what's a bit surprising the feedback i got from people who watched the feedback i got from people who watched the game was that they were quite direct and they're quite defensive so they weren't one of this fancy let's try to play out from the back and well let's get the ball up to our striker as quickly as possible and then let's let's build from there now it could be because the coach is quite smart he's being pragmatic about it realizing that he doesn't have the squad that the others have and let's play low risk football let's get the ball away from our goal rather than try and build out from the back and concede let's get the ball up and capitalize and let the other teams have to work harder to break us down and you know i'm not surprised you got khalid jamil at that club yeah so he's obviously quite a student knows indian football and he might have passed on this knowledge saying that listen with the squad we've got this is the best strategy to have and he's a great defensive coach as well absolutely so if if khalid's inputs are bigger this year than they were in the past and if they both work together with that sort of principle in mind saying that let's focus a lot on our defending and let's you know let's try and win the game in the last 10 minutes like khalid or i mean one of khalid's philosophies was pretty much keep the game close to the 80th minute don't let it get away from you and then either try and claw back a draw in the last 10 minutes or win the game in the last 10 minutes and i think if they can do that they'll definitely be one of the teams to watch out for in terms of they'll have a completely different strategy and style of play from the others and with all these other teams playing all this expansive way these guys just could be the you know smash and grab take the three points and go home kind of team yeah um, the counter punches counter punch yeah no, so I'm, so it'll be it's good to have that i know in a way it's nice that there's these different styles of play um to to challenge some of the others yeah absolutely so i i have to say this i mean i'm very pleased to see that they took care of uh, gaego for two seasons it's a very classy thing to do from the club 
And who is the place that you're looking at now? I think Apuya. Um, so that's Lalek Moya, the centre midfielder. He's the one that, um, <clears throat> if I were the club, I'd try and lock him into a long-term contract because bigger clubs are going to come after him. Um, and someone's going to be making an offer for him soon. There's a couple of other kids like um, Mapuya and others who've, who've come in. The question is, will they get game time in this club? So, not really sure which other players apart from Mapuya is really going to stick out for them in terms of their um, Indian contingent. And in terms of their foreigners, I think a lot's going to rely on Kwesi Apia because if he can get a relationship going with Gallego, they can be a threat. If not, I mean, we saw how dangerous they could have been last year if they'd kept um, the big man up front um, fit, Asamojian fit. But as soon as he went, the whole team fell apart. So <clears throat> I think that's that. Them keeping their foreign players fit throughout the season could be their key. So this is the uh, last club that we are coming at this, Odisha. I did like Joseph Gambo a lot, personally. I thought that team had a long-term plan. I mean, I thought, I don't know. I'm just assuming because of all the youngsters they have. And they were all coming along decently also, like Subham Sarangi, etc. So now the coach is gone, new coach. They've added a few more youngsters, Isaac, Bodo, etc. What do you think of them? Is it going to be, again, built for the future? Or what's going to be the plan there? Well, in terms of, I mean, credit to the club for sticking with Gamba for for two seasons. I mean, most clubs would have done that given the results that he started with and how they started off um, their journey. But I think nice guy that he was, um, Joseph Gamba, he's probably best suited for some, like an academy or a developmental role because he needs time and the long run he develops players. But yeah, sadly, we're in a business of, of winning. So you've got to get the team to the top four, and they haven't been in the top four for the last three seasons. You count their Delhi Dynamo's days. So they've gone for a big shake-up, and they've shaken up um, the squad. And again, to use that much-used um, criteria that we've said, have they retained their best foreign player? Probably not, in terms of, like, you've lost Santana. But... I think what they've done smartly because they've lost Santana is they managed to keep Onwu. So Onwu was brilliant for them. So I think in that regard, they've done well. I don't understand why they've kept um, Diagne. Um, maybe because he already had a contract that was there. So that could have been, that could be the only reason I can think of because he wasn't really one of their better um, performers of last, of last season um, in terms of their foreign players. I think one of the smart things that they've done is they've gone away from this bad habit that they had over the last few seasons of having a foreign defender, sorry, foreign goalkeeper, because that always just hamstrung the team. You automatically had less foreign players on the field and you made your team much weaker in. And they definitely were defensively last year, and bringing in Steven Taylor is a huge, huge upgrade. He's probably going to be one of the best defenders in the league, the Premier League experience, and played with uh, Williams and Krishna at um, Wellington Phoenix, a very, very good player. And Jacob Tratt's a good player too. So they're definitely stronger in that department. And they've got the sort of, um, you know, the joker in the pack is Marcelino. And it's... You know, we know what he can do when he's not playing well. In this but when he's on form, if he can recreate the player he was for them at Delhi Dynamos, I mean, he'll single-hand get them um, 20, 30 points. I mean, 20 points at least this season. Um, so it's a matter of now building the squad at home. I think, again, if you look at it from the back, goal-wise, they've got competition for places. Actually, competition from Kamal. I think so. They're definitely stronger in in the goalkeeping department, even though they don't have a you know no Dorum Soro. Defensively, they're miles miles ahead of the where they were last season. Um, I think just the left back position somewhere where they're weak. There's a height. 
And we've seen him obviously from Bangalore days and then when he moved to Pune and then he was in the under-17 squad. And then, uh, The uh, fullback position is something that um, that a tad tad weak on, and then you move into midfield. I think if they can get the balance right, you're obviously going to miss the players like Marcus Tabar and um, Chisco. So you wonder where the creative. It's all well and good playing Marcelino there as a number ten, but you need someone to probably win the balls and get it to him. Um, and that I think. Cole Alexander was supposed to be this key player for Baxter. I don't think he's in the country yet. From what I've gathered, his visa's not here yet. So that can be a problem <laughs> if your player's not in the country. He still then has to do a 14 day quarantine or whatever. So that could really hamper them in terms of um, how they set up. And we saw them yesterday. They scored two against a Mumbai team. They lost three, too. So pretty much that's as one would expect, you know, they'll get goals because Marcelino's in the team and you've got terrific wingers, Nanda who scored yesterday and you've got um, Jerry. So you, and you know, you've added a few other really impressive young kids like Bodo and the likes of um, like Daniel are still there, Samuel is there behind them. So they've got some good young, young Indian players. They lack sort of experience. I mean, their most experienced Indian player is Vinit Rai now. He's the hmm. one. Wise old man and wise old Indian player in their team, him and Kamal to an extent. So that's probably the little weaknesses. But I think Stephen Taylor will help with, help that because he's quite a good leader in the squad. And I think their biggest asset is probably going to be um, Baxter, Stuart Baxter, because he comes with a wealth of experience having coached all across the world. And I've spoken to a couple of people who played under him in South Africa and a couple, um, and they speak highly of him. Said he's a very, very good man manager and one of the best coaches that they've worked with. This is players who've played, you know, in in the A League, in the MLS, and at top levels. So that's I think that could be their could be their saving grace is that they've got an organized, uh, very organized, astute coach, head coach. Yeah. So who's the youngster that uh, you're excited about? Because I think Bodo and Isaac also, who they signed, are uh, someone to watch out for. People may not have. Known much about Isaac, but he's quite good. Yeah, you probably know more about Bodo because of his social media. But yeah. <laughs> Isaac's, probably, <laughs> Isaac's probably played more minutes recently than Bodo has. Yeah, um, yeah I think Isaac's definitely one that um, could catch the eye. But it's just a matter of will, you know, and maybe he will in the early part if Cole Alexander's missing. A lot of these guys in midfield will get opportunities to um, to show to show showcase what they can do. So I think yeah, I was going to probably mention on, you know, Isaac as one of the names um, to keep an eye on, and I think Stephen Taylor will be the with the key to them at the back, and if they're probably the dark horse for me in terms of a yeah. team getting, if they can keep themselves fit, they'll fly under the radar of a lot of it and probably sneak into the top four ahead of. So if they get in, somebody like a. BFC, ATK, Mohan Bagan or uh, Mumbai City FC, those three, if you say there or thereabouts favourites, this could be the dark horse to sneak in. Yeah, because this is why I like doing this previous with you, because I've come out with a whole other uh, understanding of certain teams, because, uh, you know, that way. So I think that was pretty interesting. And I think I've seen Steven Taylor in the Premier League yeah. playing, so to see him play here will be quite uh, impressive. He was, he was in my football manager team as well, Steven Taylor. Oh. And <laughs> really? then I was uh, coaching full time. And I'm really like, this is now it's become sort of an annual thing now where both of us do this sort of preview of, of the league. And it's actually good for I mean, me too. It makes me actually sit down and do some homework on each team and put them, you start placing the foreign players in, in their best positions. And then you realize, okay, you can only play five of them. You can't use all six. Or you can't yeah. use seven as a case where teams will have seven. So it makes you actually start think what's the best balance you can get amongst the Indian players that they have. And because we're in lockdown and quarantine now and you're stuck, the only <laughs> bits of information you have is when you start speaking to players or analysts and other people who are at other clubs and they give you a little bit of tidbits from, you know, like the guys who played against Mumbai yesterday, the, 
Odisha guys will say, yeah, Mumbai did this, Mumbai did that. They did play with a diamond like you expected. Or someone will say, yeah, East Bengal did play with a back three. So you get the information which sort of reinforces what you were already thinking. Or it dispels some of the thinking that you had. So I think it's it's a good exercise for for both of us. Yeah, and I know. And it made me actually listen to all your podcasts. Um, and I got some of the other commentators. I passed it on to them. I said, listen, you want to know more about... Um, Owen Coyle and uh, Cedar Ferrando. I said, listen to these podcasts. You'll get a good insight into them. So yeah, it's good. Thank you. It's, it's good for us as well to, uh, to get uh, learn from what your interviews. Yeah, because the issue is um, when you're speaking to coaches, it takes a while for them to trust you to speak openly and things, and that's understandable because they are coming in, they don't know what you're going to ask and things like that. So. Is the good thing about a podcast is I get an hour, 45 minutes or something to talk to them. So eventually they'll loosen up and they'll start talking. Absolutely. No, I think that's yeah. it's one of the skills journalists have is that you coax answer, answers out of coaches. So if it's in a press yeah. conference, we're normally quite curt and it's sort of yes, no, and we answer the question specifically because we want to get out of there. But when you get one-on-one -on -one time with a journalist like this where it's an hour, the inhibitions go and you could see, like, for example, in the Cesar Ferrando interview, if you'd ask a coach about his style of play, no one in preseason the way how they'll play. Mm. But over the course of that chat with you for an hour, you know, he slowly gives away that he'll actually prefers to play with a higher press. So yeah. if you listen, so, you know, as a coach listening to his preseason thing, you think, okay, if I'm BFC playing first game, then, you know, maybe play with a Deshaun Brown and look for that sort of ball over the top. Um, Or that you know you you may get that little bit of information that you think oh okay we we can look to get in behind them because they are going to be a team that presses us so you can give this little bit of information to your players so I think it's it's quite interesting how even with your own coil one uh, some of the things that he discussed with you in in the podcast and if I spoke to somebody who saw the game yesterday there is a correlation between what he said and how the game transpired yesterday. Oh, hey, that's good to know. Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen any of the games, right? So I have no oh, idea. Yeah. I'm just going by, you know, second-hand information that we're getting from the games. Yeah, but it's uh, difficult. There are some coaches who don't talk much, who generally are like Khalid Jamil. I like him, but my God, I won't say any, any like doing a podcast with him would be just me uh, asking questions uh, like and him saying, yeah, no, SNAU, SNAU. So <laughs> there are people like that also, but. It's always nice to have a coach who's always willing to explain. Like, uh, Carles is a good interview in that. He is very open about what he wants to do and things. Yeah, and I'm sure Elko is another one who will be definitely very open yeah. to discussing. Yeah, yeah I did with one with him as well when, during the beginning part of the yeah. lockdown. So, that those ways, it's nice for us also to know what these guys are up to. Like, what the plan is and their problems. Hopefully, this year, I don't know how it's going to happen. Earlier, we could always just call up and say, can we do this, do this on this time, this day? I'll come here, I'll go there. Mm -hmm. This year, I don't know what is going to happen. I'm well, trying... you might have an advantage because everyone's stuck in their hotels. So, But it's not the same if you're not sitting face to face with that person. There is also that connection that... Uh, True. If it's a new person and you haven't met them, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, maybe send them across a virtual drink and then, you know, they'll, they'll be more tempted. Yeah. <laughs> uh, nowadays everybody is uh, <laughs> everyone's all about fitness these days yeah, everyone needs a day off <laughs> yeah th today is my day off I'm moving houses I like, it's an uh, absolute mess right now I was cleaning the, in the morning and things so where you moved from Bangalore to no no I just moved from my house okay. to a different house uh, I'm Arrital looking home. to settle oh ah, okay. yeah Marital home now, yeah. Only I'm here, that's the problem. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Bachelor pad to marital home. Yeah, so now I'm looking, I'm like, this, this is dirty, what is this? Like earlier I would have been fine with it. I'm Absolutely. like, no, no, I'm calling the owner, I'm like, this is dirty, what is this? Like, you have to fix this. <laughs> so where have you been to? Which location? Indra only. Oh, nice, nice. Oh, in the yes, heartbeat. The... Good, good. Yeah, just uh, 500 meters from where I used to stay. Okay. Yeah, so everyone's saying... Prices are better now in Bangalore. If you're renting, it's a good chance to uh, move. If you go to Sarjapur side and the yeah. Electronic City side, yeah. 
this side not so much really yeah i mean it's slightly lesser but not so much that okay. side it's cheap insane like i saw the houses there and the prices they were going for i was almost in tears because <laughs> i can't commute from there whenever yeah. the office starts so it's not going to happen but yeah eventually traffic will go back to being crazy in bangalore so it's already crazy yeah yeah that's because they've dug half the roads up right so no generally also like there are people outside all the time it's just uh, it's like back to normal only there's nobody staying wait till the school yeah but wait till the school starts then it's cuz i live around where all the schools are right oh yeah 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 once school starts that it just literally becomes it's faster to walk i remember the old days uh when i was at bfc i would walk back because it was faster than driving oh yeah it's walkable from your this thing no yeah 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 Oh, yeah. I never thought of that, but I had an almost had an accident with a kid on your road. Yeah. So we were going slowly in 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 the traffic, and this kid just jumped out of nowhere, and then hit the hit my scooter's rear view mirror, and his mom was right there. And in that shock and anger, I was I I the first thing that comes out is an abuse, right? Yeah. But then I while halfway through starting, I was like, what language would he understand? <laughs> so i went from malayalam to hindi to english to then just doing something with the hand and just going away so uh, i i don't miss those days but i looking back it's funny <laughs> that <laughs> those kind of stuff do happen but yeah it's uh, cool yeah. all right man Any... pleasure again we'll always uh, always a pleasure talking to you you too man we'll keep yeah. we'll see how it transpires let's see how close we are we'll we'll do some predictions later Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You take care. Huh? Everything yeah. is fine, right there. Yeah, it's fine. Just, but that's why you're just trying to keep busy. Like these things are good. It just gives you something to do uh, <laughs> in the day, and then it's like, okay, now I'll do the next thing. I'll do something else. Otherwise, it's just you're stuck in the room. So I actually got like I prepared a lot more for this call than I would have. So that's. Oh, that's nice to <laughs> hear. I'm of use somewhere. <laughs> Okay. Anyway, thank you. Thank you so much, Madhu. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks, Madhu. I think I took uh, nearly two hours of your time also. That's all right. Time I have. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I shall keep in touch with you. We'll see what yeah. we can do through the season. Okay. Cheers. All the best. Bye.